And so we're going to talk tonight, and I'm going to start out by reading uh, some scriptures. And this one I had never even thought of, and the, and the Spirit brought it to mind. So I want to read 2 Corinthians 8, uh, 7 through 15. And listen intently, because this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. And an apostle, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, I believe, the, the Corinthians were, were the ones that Paul worked. He, he, he made tents and things while he was there because of, the, of their beliefs. And, and you, you don't want to make one stumble. So I think the essence of this was that, was that money and, and their handling of money. And, and one of the reasons he wrote this, and this is an amplified version. He says, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in word, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this gracious work of giving also. I'm not saying this as a command to dictate to you, but to prove by pointing out the enthusiasm of others, the sincerity of your love as well. This is where it gets good. It says, for you are recognizing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And Amplified, it says, abundantly blessed. And Paul says, I'll give you my opinion in this matter. He said, this is to your advantage. So he's talking about Jesus giving up and becoming poor so we can become rich. And he, he's explaining, that the, and I think this is the net that the Holy Spirit's talking about. He said, this is, this is to your advantage. Who, who were the first to begin a year ago and not only take action to help the believers in Jerusalem, but also the first to desire to do it? So I think the first knot in your net is the desire to do things for Christ. That, that is motive. That is the only acceptable motive that you can say belongs in the kingdom. And whatever we do, we desire to do it unto our king to the pleasure of our father in excellence. So he then goes on to say, so now finish this, so that your eagerness in desiring it may be equal by your completion of it. The thing is, this desire is what is going to enable you to finish strong. It's what is going to enable this net once it's prepared to be able to catch an overflowing and abundant amount of fish, so much that two boats couldn't handle it. So I want you to take this as a personal word that's being spoken here. For it is not intended now this is this is where I think the kingdom view comes in. It is not intended that others be relieved of their responsibility and that you be burdened unfairly, but that there be an equality in sharing the burden. And, and here's where I see the utility of the net. He's saying that some of you are chosen to really flourish and to really thrive. And, and this is not a burden upon you. This is a gift of favor. This is your identity in the kingdom. This is the reason that you've been given a business or a financial net. Now, it is for everyone, but he is specifically talking here about the ones where I believe is the overflow into the body, where when Kent talks about, we should be able to put people in business. I think this is a storehouse thing. There's some of us that are meant to make money to place into the storehouse. The storehouse being the kingdom, the storehouse being the generation and genesis of business, of being about your father's business. He says, at this present time, your surplus, which is what is over your necessities, is going to supply their need. So that at some other time, their surplus may be given to supply your need. That there, be, that there may be a quality. And he goes on to say, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not lack. Now, this has been, been a, a perverted political cry forever. Is, you know, you, the rich don't pay enough taxes. There should be the trickle-down theory. Why don't you give up some of your wealth? Well, you know, in, in theory, that is a proper statement, but not in heart and not in faith. What is in heart is in favor, and, and Jennifer was reminding me 
that uh, of the scripture where they uh, they brought all their possessions, sold land, did whatever, and laid it at the feet of the apostles. And and so everything that we have is given to us by the Lord. So we need to take it all and lay it at His feet and let Him decide where it goes out. So basically, what it means is the stewardship of money, the stewardship of, of financial wealth is always at the beck and call of Christ to be placed and put where he needs it to be in, in, in the kingdom. Money is the least important resource that we have. And that's the main thing I want to talk about this net. This net is to catch. The net is the most important thing that we have. And the heart that we lower the net into the water with, our motive. John D. Rockefeller, if you look at his biography, this man was a, was a God-fearing man. He will tell you that his wealth is because of tithing and so over and above. Al alms, first fruits, gifts. He found out you could not outgive God. And I want you to look at what a powerhouse he became. Most people don't even know the powerhouse in the spiritual world that he was. But in the modern day time, we're talking about someone that everybody talks about, oh, you're like Rockefeller. You know, and, and you look at the premise that this man, this man made a net. His net was made out of the principles and the foundations. Then the number one being that everything that he had belonged to Christ. And he would use it and put it where he wanted to. And he lived a, a wonderful life of giving, a wonderful life of seeing people's world change. He built all kinds of hospitals, colleges, universities. That is the aspiration and the motive because God brings money to purpose, not to people. And that's why no matter how little or much you may have in this, actually Paul said it doesn't matter. It's about the heart and what you bring with. If you lower a net in the right motive and right heart, then you're going to receive from this world money. But really what I want to look at is, is, we looked at this as the wealth of knowledge. And so, knowledge is one of the seven spirits of God. Uh, so I'm going to move over now to uh, Isaiah 11.2, if y'all want to follow. Um, and I, I mean, I can't tell you how long the Lord has had me preaching um, this. And I think if some of you here, if I've given words to and you have a business anointing, I've probably spoken this over you. But it talks about, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge, and of the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord, which we know by Proverbs that wisdom is the, is the root of the fear of the Lord. And so it ties back in that the one, one thing that God impressed, and, and I think David had a big thing to do with impressing upon Solomon, is you don't need to ever ask for money. That's not what you need to ask for. That's not even what you're really lowering your net for. That's a byproduct of what comes. Because let's face it, there's not money in heaven. It is, it is not a, a riches of the kingdom. It is a byproduct that God expects us to use here to achieve and accomplish bringing the kingdom to earth. It's a tool. There's been a value placed on it. <laughs> which is a value of mammon, not a value of righteousness. There has been a love of it that is not a true love, it's a perverted love. And as Timothy says, it's the root of many evils because it proliferates. Because everything that you worship after you worship money falls under that same thing. So the net of purity, I believe, comes out of these, uh, out, of, out of wisdom and understanding, counsel and strength, Knowledge of the reverential fear and obedience to the Lord. These are the riches. Think about it. When Christ, when Christ abdicated his throne and came, he basically left the most important riches that are possessed in the kingdom. The riches that at the cross and at the resurrection and at the ascension transferred to us. I want you to get that. Transfer of wealth, first and foremost, is a kingdom principle, and it has nothing to do with money, because we all know the currency of heaven is faith, faith of purpose and will of God. 
So when Jesus recaptured the keys of hell, we had the riches of, of, of spiritual life that came with that. Now the ascension is where this true, this true power comes because at the ascension, he sits at the right hand ever sitting for us. So, so what, what are the other things that we got that are truly the riches from him? We got his blood, the power of the blood, and we also have the use of his name. The name that God exalted above every other name. Now, is there a greater treasure or a greater riches than that? And what I'm trying to do is, is, to, is to form some ground because I'm not a prosperity preacher, but I do believe that God wants every one of us prosper. Now I get that from 1 John 3. Because as you, you are prosperous, because your soul prospers. God's intention is to lead you to these riches. Because it even says in the scripture, to make friends of unrighteous mammon, and it's after the parable of the, of the, uh, of the servant that whittles off uh, the debt that everyone owes him. And then there's many teachings on that, and I'll just suggest, I'll share it to you what I've heard. I believe he cut his commission off. I did not believe, because I did not believe that the Lord would have said what he said about him if he'd stolen money from the king. So I believe he took off his part, because it was better stored up in heaven as an act of charity and kindness, because he, would, he had no skill. Remember, he said, I can't labor. I can't do this. So he had to, he had to place it somewhere. He had to place it in the riches, the love, the wisdom, the knowledge. And so, therefore, he would always be treated kindly as he went on. That is what I believe uh, that that is about. So Jesus is our ultimate riches. And now his Holy Spirit that he gave us, the ascension. The ascension is where it was multiplied. When he went to sit and sent the Spirit down, and the Spirit fell at Pentecost, you saw the true wealth of what the cross and the resurrection did. Because immediately the wind blew, the tongues of fire fell. Peter walks out, speaks, and everybody that has a different language can understand what he's saying, number one. Number two, he evangelizes like, like 3,000 people. But then the most extraordinary thing happens is as he's walking, the shadow he casts heals. Well, I suggest to you that you won't find in Scripture that even Christ did that. So what is that, what is that a rep representation of the glory, the riches in Christ? We are the hope of the Lord. Christ in us, the hope of glory. What I'm trying to tell you is if you already contain everyone in here, no matter what your paycheck is, what kind of house you live in, you already contain the wealth of God. You have the entire abundance and overflow of heaven. So the key is, is how do I turn that through my identity, my calling? Because I do not believe there's a vocational and a ministry separation. We are all priests and kings. Some of us may be dominant kings, some dominant priests, but we're all some, we're all kings and priests. So, so I would suggest to you that there is a desire, there is a DNA that's been placed in you, there is a calling that extends from your eternal self that has been, that was born before time that was placed in, when you were placed in your mother's womb. There, there, there is a connection between your eternal life and the life that we live here, just as he explained today, about overcoming and testing. And, 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 the, and he was awesome when he pulled out today uh, about the temptation. Is it, you know, the temptation for money here is to take it for your use. When, when God has always given me a view of the commerce, because he's always said it, it's not about business, it's about relationship. And you think about, you know, when the new earth is here and we're functioning, you know, I believe life will be incredible. I believe we'll enjoy God's creation. I think we'll snow ski, mountain climb, scuba dive, uh, everything. And the thing is, how do, you, how do you do all that when there's not going to be money? So that begs the question. We are a shadow of the kingdom, correct? The word, the word says what exists what exists here exists in heaven. This is as, as the tabernacle. We know the tabernacle is real. 
So if it's a shadow, what is our economic shadow really truly supposed to be about? It's about the needs of each other. It's about God providing for all of our needs. How does he do that? He does it through the giftings that contain vocational desires in us. How many people do you know that are not happy at their job or they make a lot of money? And then to become happy, they buy things that they think will make them happy, right? Well, that's not the proper alignment. How about if you could pick what you wanted to do and the world would honor it by what Paul said, it didn't matter if you made $100 and this guy made 1000 because of the relationship of everyone, it would literally be laid at the apostles' feet and Jesus would do the wealth distribution. Mammon wouldn't lock up all the beautiful things to look at in creation. Mammon wouldn't steal the fact that kids live 10 miles from the ocean and have never gotten in it because they can't get there or their parents don't care. We are God's greatest love and greatest creation. The whole book is about the redemption of us. It's about bringing us into intimacy. So our greatest wealth is also God's greatest wealth. It's really us. So how do we manufacture or get him and get to a place to where we can understand how we truly are the riches in Christ. How do we truly affect and change the world in the financial world? That, that's the place where, and I'm going to go now to Ephesians uh, 2.7, if you want to follow me there. Um, these next few are, are, are in Ephesians. And it said, uh, as, as he raised us up together with him, when we believe, seated us with him in heavenly places, because we are in Christ Jesus. And he did this so that in the ages to come, he might clearly show the immeasurable and unsurpassed riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawn to you that you have been saved. Salvation, rebirth, another riches, another place that allows us to, to move the rebirth of our spirit into the rebirth of our economic system, to get aligned, to understand that the net that we make is not a net of this world, but it works in this world, and it actually rules and reigns this world. If we will use it as the Lord instructed the fishermen to. They were out fishing by their own knowledge. As soon as they listened to the wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord, because face it, the Lord knew where the fish were, right? I mean, he had no, he knew where the fish were. So go out, load them in on this side. That same principle only comes from understanding the wealth and the riches in Christ. And that's pray here and obey. This goes along with how do you pull on those? Pray here and obey. This is how you get it. So it's the, the knowledge is one of the pathways, one of the spirits of God wants you to be prosperous. Now I'm going to uh, head to Ephesians 3.18. And I just like, I want you to see the scriptural net. Because, you know, I can sit up here and suggest to you what I've seen, but until you see it and you believe it, you're not going to assume my net. I'm not going to be able to give you a net. But because I want you to make your own net for this. So uh, Ephesians 3, 18 starts, I'll be, um, I'm going to start before that. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith and that you may, having been deeply rooted, securely grounded in love and other riches, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints the width, length, and height, and depth of his love, fully experiencing the amazing, endless love, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, that's speaking of riches. So that you'll be fully rich of all the riches of God. Again, we see that the key to using and finances here is what has been transferred to us through the word, through the cross, through the blood, through the name. Through God inviting us in and giving us an invitation to understand his ways. When it talks about the, the width, length, and height, to me what he's saying is 
is the strategy, the blueprints, and the know-how of how to fish in this world. Because face it, God needs us. God needs us to understand and get our motive right so we can build the kingdom here on earth. Because our, our job is to bring it here. So our job is to build things here, and building things here takes money. And, and the thing is, God set it up that way. You know, I was explaining earlier, uh, Randy's a home builder, and so if I'm a pot maker, and Randy builds me a home, well, Randy doesn't need a thousand pots, right? And so God had to come up with this medium of, of, of exchange, especially since if, if we were going to have commerce with other cities and then other nations. But the problem is, is the value has been placed on that, not on the relationship of him supplying a need for me and me supplying a need for him, as we read in one of the scriptures earlier. So God's, God's economy is the need of man. God becomes the, our provider through using us to provide for each other. Am I explaining that? Now, are y'all getting what I'm saying? That, that's the, that's the, 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 the bigger picture of why we're all part of one body, why we all rely on each other. Now, how many, how many, you know, um, if you go into a western town, you're going to go by, and every western town is the same. Stable, you know, blacksmith, dry goods store, probably an undertaker, saloon, you know, well, that took care of the needs. When a family came into town in their wagon, they got all their provisions. But that provision is not the object. Who did that provision come from? Why did the guy open the stable? Okay? I'm suggesting to you that that was a God plant inside of him. Because it's a need that provisions the body. Take it to a bigger economic scale of New York City. You know, well, my gosh, Mark, there's 900 of these, 900 of those, 900 of those. Yeah, because there's, what, seven, 8 million people in Manhattan alone? So you start thinking about the multiplication. So therefore, there are vocationally the same giftings, but still uniquely in the way that you're going to do it. Because how you interpret the riches to move in. So you see, one feeds another. It's like a champagne glass. You pour into one, it fills it, all the others up. And it's the riches of Christ and the transfer of wealth. And the, what we're doing now is we're, is I'm, I am feeding you the knowledge of what the Holy Spirit has showed me about how to make and form this net. And so uh, the last verse, you ready to go? Go ahead. Okay. I tend to look at things from history to see kind of what God's done to know where we're going. That's the whole point of the thing, the season that I've been in with you. So to add on to that, that wealth isn't necessarily money, it's bigger than that. You know, we all need each other, like Mark was saying, in order to help each other. We're one body. You know, my hands are a foot, and, and, you know, we're a body, and we're supposed to help each other. Okay, so from history, after Jesus, you know, the disciples went out, and they took, they fulfilled the Great Commission. They got the word out to the habitable world, which was the Roman Empire. That was the word that was used, the Greek word that was used. Okay, they had miracles. Peter did more with his shadow than Jesus did. We just said that. So all of these miracles were happening. Those things we know from recorded history that things like that actually happened until about the 200s, the third century. After, you know, people were raising the dead well past the 12 disciples and the 23 disciples that are mentioned in the New Testament. That was the culture, the church culture of Christianity at that time. They were doing these miracles for a couple hundred years. And it started dwindling out in the late 200s. Well, in the 300s, the Nicene Creed happened, and they Constantine legalized Christianity, and it just fizzled out, and the power left. And we know that from recorded history. That's when, you know, the, the Catholic Church started rising up. They took away, whether intentionally or not, some people believe that it was a control thing. It could have been. But it, the knowledge was taken from the people, and the power was gone because the protocols and the structure changed. So we have through the Dark Ages, through the Crusades, you know, the church was powerless, and it was all in control. The language changed. All the, the Bible was in Latin, so the common people didn't know it. They didn't have access to the knowledge. While the Reformation came in the 1500s, power was given back to the people. They had the knowledge, and they started 
beginning to function again as the body, as God intended the body to function. So in the last 500 years, we started rising up. We got the head knowledge. We got the experience knowledge. It was given back to the people. Well, if we just look in the last 100 or 150 so years, God has been bringing back the evangelists and the pastors, and we've had the the preachers going around on horseback, and the Great Awakening started to get the power back to the people. God has done that. He's doing this, which is why there's this message lately of the transfer of the wealth. It's not money, like Mark is saying. It's the knowledge and the wisdom. God has empowered his people to prove that this is what he's doing. You know, I'm, I'm very familiar with that word that you were talking about. Like, I read it all the time. You know, it's because I see, because part of that word says um, that God told William Branham is that there's going to be this teaching movement of Christ in you, but then it would end. And we see that in the Jesus people movement of the 60s and 70s. It was that Christ in you message and the teaching movement. Well, then in the 80s was the evangelistic movement and God has restored the prophets and apostles. And that was a part of the word too, that before this, explosion comes, this Holy Ghost bomb that God is going to bring to us, he is restoring the apostles and the prophets back to the forefront of the church. He's done that. Something is coming, but in order to get this that Mark is talking about, we need each other. And he's been restoring that, this well, but there's more to it that's coming. So through history, if you look at it, you can see that God is bringing this up. Well, why? There's got to be a purpose in it, but everybody's saying it's not something that we're very familiar with. It's never been done before, but it's coming. And that's, this is part of it, is the transfer of the wealth, but wealth from God's point of view, not man's point of view. Good word, Jim. So we got in Philippians. That's a really good word. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> got a little speechless there. Man, that's power on that word, folks. You can write that. You remember what she said? Write that down. That was that was a lot of power on that. So we got to Philippians four nineteen, and I'm gonna read a little bit before that because this is Paul again, and, and the reason I'm using this is because Paul walked in a way with God that was equal to the way that he walked without God, and I think that we are all living relations of that, having having to have to be reborn and walk through our salvation walk. So you see him redeeming, and basically. In some places, his, his ministry was supported. But that's the main thing that we're talking about here. Paul relied on the wealth of Christ in him. He relied on the ascended Christ. He relied on this to fulfill. You know, Jesus sent him out and said, don't take your money back. You can see so many levels of the wealth that we're talking about. And so, you know, he says, now that I seek the gift itself, but I, I do seek the profit which in, in profit, P-R-F-I-T, not E-T, which increases to you, to your account, the blessing which is accumulating for you, but I have received everything in full and more, and I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. They are a fragrant aroma and offering an acceptable sacrifice, which God welcomes and in which he delights. Again, we can all do that. That is the purpose and motive. Kings or priests move and motivate the kingdom of Christ, save souls, bring heaven to earth. And then he says 19, and he says, and, now this is, my God will liberally supply, which means fill until full your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a promise. Other ways it says you can't outgive God. John D. Rockefeller lived because he made a net. The same net that the disciples made. The same net that Paul made. The same net that we're supposed to make. The knowledge of how to accumulate the riches in Christ first. And how to, and how to accumulate the wealth of the wicked to the wise. Because once you have a net like this. That's a wise net. God can fill a wise net. God can't fill a wicked net. So that's the transfer. Wicked to wise. And this is what he understood. So you see it again 
in the widow. When, when, when Elijah, I think it was Elisha that came, or it was either Elisha or Elijah that came to the widow. He says, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm going to bake this couple of small cakes. My son and I are going to eat them, then we're going to die. And he says, well, so now think about this. This is a guy, got the riches, because the Spirit said in this guy. Comes in and says, look, strategy, word of wisdom. I'll tell you what, make me a small one, feed me first. What is he really saying there? He's really saying, take the riches of the kingdom first. Because if you give me what little bit you have, then he can multiply. And what did he do? He put her in the oil business. Didn't just give her more provision. He put her in the oil business. So there's a business. So when you see what comes out of is not the end result. Business is not what we're looking for, guys. We're looking for the wisdom and the knowledge that makes the net, where to lower the net, but it's still about supplying each other's needs because that's what God is about, supplying our needs. You know, there's, there's you know, hairdressers and plumbers and electricians and, 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 and all of the, and I know some of, and some of those are the happiest guys in the world. They love solving problems. They like coming in. You know, think about restoring a house, tearing out, replacing. I've seen guys stand there and look at their work like, like I'd look at Jesus. It's all in us. It's about having the knowledge that allows you. And it's why it's so, you so need to mentor your children and look at what your children do for fun and look at what God has placed in them. That's going to show you vocationally where they need to go because they will be blessed. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be the things that gather into the net of the world and be unhappy. God has made the fullness in you. And that's what it talks about here. And God will, will literally supply to your every need according to his riches, according to him. And this is, this is truth that he's speaking. And this is truth that's saying everything works together for the good. You, you can even pull the Romans 8, 28 into this. Because if we all lay down our money at Christ's feet and we look at the, we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we look at kindness and general, I mean, liberality general, is a gift. And it's kind of what God has given us. I think in, in the view of tithing, it's not so much about, well, I sit in this seat in this church, so I got to give my 10% here. No, where does God want you to put your 10%? God may want you to help a guy start a business. Talk to the guy so he can start a business, not have to go into debt. That's what it's about. That's helping each other's, that's feeding desires. It's like God says, I got a budding, a budding plumber over here, but he can't afford to go to plumbing school. Send him. That, I mean, you can do no greater thing. That's what all this is, is, is about. And that's why motive and purpose of building the net on the riches of Christ is what makes you be able to take the wicked and bring it to you, the wise, and then use it in the way that God said. I believe that is the commerce of the kingdom. And tomorrow, I'm going to go in more elaborately into the difference between business and commerce and some scriptures uh, and, and talk a little bit about the Boaz anointing and Ruth and stuff like that. Um, but the Lord, I, I think, really, the formation of the net. So, you know, take a lot of time, because all of us are in business in here some way or the other. Look at how, don't make a better mousetrap, make a better net. Because God will fill the net. That's a promise. It's in scripture. It's been done. So you need to make the net of wisdom and knowledge and the heart and the motive of others and love. And that net will always be full because he knows you'll use it for the ones. You see what I'm saying? And it unlocks. It absolutely breaks the back of poverty. It breaks the back of mammon. And it releases the economy actually be what it was for, which is to subdue and take dominion back to Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Make everything the garden. So that's my Jeff, you got something? I just want to add on something a little. When he was talking about, you know, you sow into somebody who, hey, he wants to be a plumber or something, you know? In my church circle before I connected with PNC. It was a common prophetic word that I heard all the time that God was going to change the current church structure. And we can see that now that that is what happened. People are leaving the church 
structure left and right all the time. Churches are shutting down all the time. That is God, I think. He is changing the way that church has been done because it needs a shakeup. We need to get out of the traditional way that we've been doing things because we are the church. The building isn't the church. It's where the church meets. But we don't necessarily need need the church building like we've needed it before. So God is changing the way that the church is done. But what is painful sometimes is all the little details that go along with that change of structure, which is why people are uncomfortable with the whole, where do you put your money? Well, if we no longer have these church buildings that we've done for hundreds of years and you just faithfully give your tithe every Sunday, we have to adjust how we do that. So if the church building isn't technically the church and we are the church and somebody is going into a business and they're just leading people to Jesus all the time because they're a plumber, isn't that the church? And if Holy Spirit puts it on you to bless that person, you are giving to the church. So I have, in the last couple of years, I've adapted that and just weekly, you know, because we, I don't work, my husband works, we get a regular paycheck. So I dedicate a certain amount Hey, God, this is for you. Sometimes I give it to our church building because that's where we go all the time and we're plugged in there and we're connected. But other times I'm just working with people who are the church. They're doing the stuff. I'm going to give it to them. And I have so much more joy because of that, because I'm getting, if God is changing it, we have to adjust these things, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable and it'll ruffle some feathers who, of the people who are trying to hold on to those traditions. And it might be an uncomfortable transition that we deal with for a few decades, but we got to do it because God's changing it up. And, and the churches really should be uh, bring them in, clean them, train them, equip them, send them out. They should have revolving doors. Front and the back door should always be open. They should be brought in, done, and sent out. Sent back into the marketplace. You don't live and live your life based around that. Once you've been trained, equipped, and move out, you really are the church, and the church, the formation of the church, and the formation of cities that have a hundred thousand people. I and mean, there's a hundred thousand churches there in that city. There's a hundred thousand destinies. There's a hundred thousand sets of giftings. There's a hundred thousand loves and fragrance and worship going up to Christ. And the commerce is secondary to that because that's the relationship. But out of that springs business that supplies the needs of that community. That's the true definition of church. The church used to be in the old times was the banker. The courts, it was everything. Well, since we're the church, we fulfill all those roles. By how many is necessary to provide the needs of how large our city is. Then our cities become identities. City on the hill, we become identities. And our cities support sister cities. And those cities support the state. And that state congregates with others and supports the nation. The nations get together and support other nations. You can see the, the trickle-down effect of how it's supposed to work. And it starts with one, because one can influence a nation. And that's where, I, now Randy's got a testimony I'd love for you guys to hear. Um, he told it to me today, I just think it's powerful. And it has to do with, with, with money here, the reality of life. Thanks for sharing. So um, I shared this with you, other folks, but when God began to move in my life and I felt the call of God to do what, Whatever he was going to send me to do, and I was searching, and you know, I was younger at that time, but uh, I had built my second new home, and my wife and I had moved into it, and we were happy. And, and the church we were affiliated with was planting churches, and so I was praying about this: Do I want to work in one of these church plants, or want to get involved? And one day, my wife came to me, and she said, uh, "If God tells you to go somewhere, I'm ready to go." So we had this really, you know, pretty reasonably nice new home. <laughs> and I sold that home and I went out and I found a church building and I started a church. And for a time of about three and a half years, I went precipitously broke until I was totally broke. I had bought another farmhouse near the church where I had started it and uh, I couldn't even figure it out because as a contractor, I figured I can advertise anywhere I'm at. I've always been able to stir up the work to just come here. But it didn't work. And so after a period of time, I thought, well, 
second house, I sold it. We actually moved into an apartment. And I couldn't pay my car insurance. And so I'm frustrated, depressed, don't know what to do. Jeff preached in the church and told me to go. But the money wasn't coming. And our pastor had sent my wife a book on fasting. And our pastor or the tent mentioned this morning how there are times we cross from this economy, from this physical life, and we cross over and we we're in prayer at times and we hear from God and, and then we're back into the natural. And there's these times that we get over and what Mark is talking about, we're getting into God's economy. We're getting into God's provision that's provided for us in, in the spirit. So what had happened is my wife began to fast and God just as she was willing to lose weight in the holiday. Saturday. And as soon as she started, she did not all she did was drink a half a glass of water a day for 10 days. And I wasn't, I paid no attention to what she was doing. I didn't have a clue. I, didn't, I mean, I was like, you know, I'm just, what's going on here? I could not figure it out. And for just for 10 days, she had fasted, and uh, I didn't think anything of it. But something just hit me in the head. This lady that I knew was an investor. And she liked to invest in her own contracts, which means basically where you would buy a house and you know you own that one contract. And so she had some land that I bought from her, you know, she had this 80 acre parcel. And uh, I had built two houses on it was on a corner. And so I had two 10 acre parcels. I built one for a favorite part of my husband. And I had all the knowledge of that land, but I hadn't taught to this lady for two and a half, three years. And it just hit me. So it's all going on. So on a Monday morning, I just called her. And here's literally what she said. She said, I've been expecting your call. She knew nothing. I mean, how could she say, I've been expecting your call? And I said, well, I was wondering if you'd like to come here and loan me and sell the second house, sell me a piece of land and loan me your money for another house. And she said, I just sold my condo in Florida. I guess the money I've got to invest is come on over. I drove to her house. She wrote me a check. She said, You take the rest of that land and do whatever you want with it. It was 37 acres there that was had been divided in. In Michigan, you can divide land into as many 10 acre parcels as you want with only four under 10. So this 80 acre parcel already can have it. But after 10 years, each parcel becomes a parent parcel. So they can be divided. So I was there in one day, by God's grace, when we leaped over into that spirit realm, God's provision, everything in one day was restored. I sold those parcels off and doubled my money and more than doubled my money. I built another home. But it was in one day. Fasting and prayer gets us in that place where we begin to hear God and begins to move in that spirit realm things that God's provided for us. And I know we all have a story in our life and we've all had challenges. But if we can begin to understand that God's already made these provisions if we know how to walk in them. And I've seen that happen more than that time in my life. And I've had my ups and downs as well. So but I think what God's really calling us to, and I think this is what Mark is saying, is we if we're willing to walk in that, this is the transition. We're not going to be counting dollars. We're going to be looking at God's provision and how we pay our bills. So uh, that part of the testimony I share a lot, and it's one of those wild things out there that I see in life. That also challenges me to seek God more. And in the human sense of what he's saying. Thank you, Mark. And you can see where he did the same thing that he had been doing before, and I have the same testimony. It doesn't work. That's because the Lord is what's telling you is he says, hey, I've got greater things for you than just the wealth of this world that you can earn. Remake your mess. Retool your company. Realign your motives. Realign your heart. Realign your purposes with me. Redo the net. Redo your net. And, and, and I think tomorrow you'll see why, where, where that goes in the world. But, but, you know, so many things we can use today um, 
There's, there's, like, there's a new move of deliverance God told me is coming. Well, I had a little honeymoon period with God where everybody that I just walked up and said, hey, and hugged, and demons would just run and scream, they would get delivered. And that was a forerunning of what's coming. There's always better coming. It's not supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be fun, actually. Christians should be the most adventurous, fun life ever. We should be the happiest people on the planet, the most powerful people on the planet, the most general pe people on the planet, the most loving people on the planet. Because the Lord said, I want them to know my people by how they love one another. And that's part of that, that, that new net. God's getting serious about separating. God's getting serious about the ones that will obey and listen and form their life. Your whole life is based off these principles. So why shouldn't your business and your economy be? If we did, then we're going to be so powerful because if people, if we control that much money, we're going to control and be able to speak into churches and reform them, speak into the political places, reform health care, reform, make sure a child never goes hungry. I mean, just think about the things. And that, that's God's heart. That's our motive. That's our end means. That's all that we're about. Laying at his feet. So. Kent, where do you want to go from here? <laughs> well, Jennifer mentioned doing Q&A um, questions and answers. I don't, I don't mind doing that. Um, we've got another session coming up at nine where we'll be doing ministry, prophesying, and laying on the hands. Um, let me just ask, do any of you have a question of Mark, Randall, or Jennifer about the subject that they're they're speaking of tonight? Okay, just one second. Do we need to really speak that because we're still on the webinar? And, um, you know, they want to hear too. <clears throat> Mark, Randall, or Jennifer, do you have any Same thing as the, the righteous is, is the wise, the right living. You know how to right live because you have prayed here and obeyed, and God has been able to transfer the wisdom and the knowledge of right living to you. And so the righteous, it is laid up for the righteous. So it's the wealth, it's just not having to make a living. We're not supposed to have a job, we're supposed to have a life in Christ. Our life in Christ is our job, and it's supposed to be able to flourish. <laughs> And it's supposed to be able to, to go to overflow and abundant so we have plenty to lay at the feet of Christ to help those that are not that, that, that still have not become wise. We're never going to turn anybody away. And, and, and that, that proverb basically says, if you'll form your net out of me in the way that you're supposed to, then you can trap the wicked mammon of the world, bring it into a righteous, in a righteous situation, will be a motive of love and sharing and making sure that your neighbor's kids are fed, you know, or putting somebody in business, sending some of children to college that they can't afford. So so everybody can be in their identity. That's that's what I, I believe it means. Kent, you have a yeah, go ahead. Um, if that answers your question. That I'm gonna use that verse tomorrow night. <clears throat> Anyone else? Please. I mean you know, it, it is a little stretching, so well, well, I, I, don't, I mean, of course, I'll answer all the time I can. I'm not going to make something up. So. Do, do you understand where, where we're heading with this? You know, our life is not our own, so neither are our finances, but yet when we give them to Christ, they, we can be richer than we could ever be in our, in our health. Because our availability to have wealth is for others, not for self. But yet we'll leave fine in the meantime. Because once you're converted and wise, you're not going to want six cars, four houses, 900 vacations. Once you're wise, then you're going to want to help God do what he needs to be done. That's, that, that's how I was going to preach that tomorrow. The only thing I would add to the topics that we're discussing is that you know, over the years, I've heard people say, well, I've given my business over to God. 
but they're in bankruptcy. Now that, that, that doesn't make sense. If you gave your business over to God, why is it in bankruptcy? Because you can't just say, God, we give this to you, and that's it. That's not the way that works. If you've truly given your business over to God, that means you're seeking God for everything you spend. You understand what I'm saying? Whenever you start praying harder for what you do with the money you have than you pray to get that money, then you have finally arrived where you are a good steward of what God has given you. A lot of people spend a lot of time praying to get their wealth. But when God gives it to them, I don't care how small it is. Do they ask God about where to spend it or do they just go blow it? Because the, the key is recognizing it's his and recognizing that what you do with it is his decision, not yours. And you'll be surprised how many things he will make you wait for only to find that you saved a bundle. Because in this day and time, it's not how much you make, it's how much you save. That's the key. How much do you save and making it work? That's personal or business or ministry. Because you're constantly looking to find out, God, what would you have us do? You know, we could have done a lot of things earlier in this ministry, but we waited. Because I learned back when we went through that whole ordeal that I told you about, 12.93%. We didn't wait on God long enough to find the answer. We weren't patient enough. And as a result, we went through a whiplash effect. God bailed us out, yes, but he doesn't want you to contend to go in that manner. You know, you can learn what you're from your mistakes, but if you don't learn from your mistakes, you, you just keep making mistakes. And we got to get out of that revolving door. Another thing, poor people have four ways. That's a cliche, but it's also a truth. Because if you're not making it, then you need to look and find out from God, what is it that I'm doing wrong? Because you're in a revolving door. you got to change something. Because if you keep going into poverty over and over and over again, there's something you're doing incorrectly. And you got to find out what it is. The answer is not more money. The answer is, where's my God in the midst of this? And you got to find it. That's all I would have to say about it. And I think that's our purpose and motive. God to get you to align with him so he can bless you. Because he knows that, that you will be a good steward. It's forming that good stewardship. And you Because when you have a leaky net or a leaky bucket or a torn net, uh, then there's something wrong between you and God. It's, it's not necessarily uh, the the outflow of your business technique. It's probably more likely, uh, if you're praying for your business, it's probably more likely that it's something between you and the Lord. It's, it's something that he needs to come into alignment. That's what I found in, in my testimony, which I'll, I'm going to share some of that tomorrow night. But, uh, well, we have a lot more for tomorrow night. On the same topic, by the way, but a different message and a different... Um, angle of being able to approach these things to make your life work more in freedom because really the spirit of liberty is freedom and being in poverty is not freedom being in massive debt is not freedom there's a freedom about being debt free and, and being able to take care of everything without worrying about it that keeps you sane in a lot of ways you know we we are a nation of impulsive buyers we don't need to be part of that nation we need to be a nation of good stewards of what god gives us and i'll make a huge difference in the way things work for you if y'all don't have anything i'll close it out we'll take a short break before we come back i want to say one more thing there's there's monetary systems that operate outside the banks and it's families that have gotten together and support each other's business ventures and and they and the lord told me mergers and acquisitions are going to be big this year so start looking for people that God puts you to partner with. You have one gift, they have another. When you combine them, a third child comes out. A better product comes out. Or acquire. God will show you to bring under your covering and under your. And then what you're really doing is bringing a bunch more uh, people to disciple under your setting. Or to come together to form it. And if you look at that, it's two become one. It's, not, it's the same symbiotic thing as marriage. And then it's the combinations that is the, the Trinity, one and two, and then the outflow of the Spirit, three, for this, this time. So God's been showing me that those of you that have successful businesses, look for other ones to buy or look for things to merge with if God shows you a new creation. Don't just sell your business and take the money and go do something else. Look at those two things first. That's it.